Hello and good evening and welcome everyone to our first live um, community meeting and we welcome everyone and we're happy that everybody was able to uh, make it this evening and I would like to introduce myself. I am Melissa Hernandez and I am your mayor um, of the city of Dublin and I will go ahead and let um, our vice mayor Jean Josie um, go ahead and introduce herself. Hi, I'm Jean Josie, vice mayor of Dublin. Welcome everybody. And then I also would just like to let staff um, go ahead and introduce themselves as well. I'll start off. Good evening, everyone. I'm Colleen Tribby. I'm the assistant city manager. You don't see my face yet, uh, but you will shortly. And I'm John Stefanski. I'm the assistant to the city manager. So we would like to welcome everyone this evening and um, hope that you had a wonderful Monday. Um, and I'm so happy to be here with you as we um, go on to our first live um, meeting. So this evening for our first ever live with our Dublin City Council event, uh, these events will take place on the first Monday of every quarter and will feature special, special guests. And so of course, tonight we have our vice mayor and uh, Jean Josie and some of our staff. So last month, at a Dublin uh, Chamber of Commerce event, I was invited to present the state of the city. And it's a state of the city address that we normally all mayors do here in the Tri-Valley. And um, some of us have done it live and some of us have actually um, done it just via Zoom still. So we're still getting into the hang of being out um, in, in front of our audience. So we, are, we were glad that we were able to have it live uh, this particular year as well as last year. So we thought that this would be a timely topic for tonight's live event. And so I'm honored to be uh, your mayor, of course, and lucky to share the dais with my fellow council members. And as you all see, um, our vice mayor is here this evening, but our entire council consists of Sean Kumagai, council member Sherry Hu, and council member Mike McCorston. And this position comes with great purpose and responsibility and the, the decisions that the city council and I make will have a lasting impact for decades to come. Dublin is celebrating its 40th anniversary of incorporation this year and it's our Ruby anniversary. 40 years ago, a handful of Dublin residents recognized that it was no longer in the city's best interest to have the county make decisions for the populace. So together, these residents stood firm and united, initiating a plan to become a city. We are forever indebted to those pioneers for their wisdom, vision, and fortitude in seeing what could be making it, making us become a city. And so 40 years later, the city of Dublin has become a highly sought after community um, with a wonderful quality of life. Later this year, we will be holding a special gala that we hope you join us um, later on this summer for our Dublin's 40th year anniversary, where we will also present a special documentary on the city's incorporation. The city prides itself in maintaining positive relationships with the many supportive nonprofit organizations in the Tri-Valley. Our community grant program, um, which we have every year, we actually were able to provide um, $352,000 to 17 different nonprofit organizations in the Tri-Valley in the past year. So as you see on the screen, this is just a few um, that we were able to provide to. And moving on to our finances on the financial front, I'm also delighted to say that we are stronger than ever in our city. The city prepares a two-year budget in addition, in addition to a two-year forecast. And we are currently in the second year of a two-year budget adopted by the city council in June of 2021. The forecast um, that we adopted will, is shown right here on the screen. And so in 2021 and 2022, our general fund amended operating budget is in a surplus position with revenues exceeding operating expenditures by $17 million. Our property taxes and our sales taxes are the largest ongoing revenue sources. Our sales tax revenue grew in a fiscal year or 2021-2022. The general fund will also contribute 
$15.8 million to capital improvement projects this fiscal year, $11.2 million for set-aside design designated reserves, and $1 million to the internal service funds, and $1 million to our pension unfunded liability. Our total general fund reserves are projected at a $209.1 million by June 30th, 2022, and the city's valuation, and this is the assessed value of our what our property in our city of Dublin is worth, is over $20 billion, an increase of $736 million from the prior year. So as you can see, Dublin is in a very strong position financially. Moving on to our economic development, our strong financial position is directly related to the health and well being of our business community. During the pandemic, our economic development team developed much needed programs to support our local businesses struggling to make ends meet, including emergency grants and loans. Thank you and thanks to all these programs, most of these businesses are still in operation. Even better, our business community is growing stronger. Here's a simple, sorry, excuse me, here is a sample of the new businesses who set up shop here in Dublin just in the last year. In total, we have over 2,300 businesses in the city more than 8 million square feet of commercial development, more than 32,000 people employed, and a 3.2% of unemployment rate. So in the office segment, as you drive down a Dublin Boulevard, you will see this beautiful building. Um, and we saw Carl Seiss Meditech open their new Seiss Innovation Center, which houses the research and development production, sales and customer services division. We also were able to um, acquire North American title here in our own city. Um, and at least and North American title signed at least at the Dublin Corporation Center. So in the light industrial and warehouse market, the city already has 1.6 million square feet of lease space, out of which 95% is currently occupied. Dublin has a stable and thriving retail market with ma uh, major retailers and centers spread throughout the city. With 4.1 million square feet of retail space, we can boast a low vacancy rate of only 5.5%. And I'm excited to announce that our PGA Tour Superstore will be coming soon to Hacienda Crossings, filling one of the vacant big box site, boxes site at the complex. We believe that the store's presence will bring other retailers to our Hacienda crossings. I've talked at length before about changing changes coming to our downtown as we move forward with a preferred vision. The Dublin Place shopping area, currently home to Target, Hobby Lobby, and Burlington, will become a town square with the true Main Street experience making it a walkable uh, biking area, more accessible in our downtown district. And everything that you know our residents have been asking for, more of a pedestrian friendly area. So we hope to see some initial changes in the next five years. In our east, Eastern Dublin, um, once the extension of our Dublin Boulevard to Livermore is complete, the idea is to transform the area into an economic development zone, a thriving corridor where we hope to attract new industries, which will serve as a catalyst for job creation, as well as additional tax revenues to support our city services and programs. In the community development arena, the efforts of our economic development division and community development, development departments make Dublin stronger than ever. These two departments work very closely to bring the city's council's vision to fruition. One of the seven mandated elements of the city's general plan is the housing element, which is updated every eight years to address the existing 
and the projected housing needs for all economic needs of the city. This is done through the regional housing needs allocation as determined by the state and by the Association of Bay Area Governments. Here you can see the RENA housing numbers for the City of Dublin for the 2023 through 2031 planning period. We anticipate that we can meet our RENA numbers with, project, with projects already in the works, production of accessory dwelling units and rezoning additional sites to create approximately 1,300 units. And I know many residents always ask about our arena numbers and our housing numbers. And so this will give you a better glimpse and an idea of where each category will fit. We'll fit in the very low, the low income, moderate income, and above moderate income. So housing affordability is very important to our city council. We re recently approved Amador Station by Bridge Housing, creating 300 units next to the West Dublin BART station. Another project is the Regional Street Senior Affordable Housing, which will be built by our Eden Housing nonprofit organization. This project will support low and very low income seniors and special need applicants, and will provide 113 affordable units. The city council also took steps to preserve housing for middle income earners by joining two housing authorities and approving the issuance of bonds for the purpose of acquiring the Waterford Place apartments, the fountains at the Emerald Glen and the Astor apartments for middle income rental housing. In terms of planning, the city went through an extensive community outreach process to develop a preferred plan for the SCS property 79 acres of parcel along the Tassajara Road. The plan calls for a neighborhood main street experience with 40,000 square feet of regional retail shops and entertainment. In total, between 200 and 400,000 square feet of commercial retail space is being planned. The development will also include affordable housing, for entry level buyers and up to 550 market rate units. The city will also feature a Grand Paseo, which will run the length of the properties with a fantastic view of uh, Mount Diablo. In our infrastructure and park development um, arena, as you can see here, the bicycle and pedestrian master plan is being updated at the city as seeking feedback for, um, from the Dublin community through an online survey. The survey um, will be asking input and then we will take that input as we receive it and we will help develop a plan that addresses the needs of people who love to walk and bike in Dublin, which I'm sure it's almost all of us here in our own city of Dublin. So work is well underway at two future city of Dublin parks. And as you see here on the on our screen, our beloved, um, you know, our former vice mayor, Don Biddle, which will, um, we will be having a 30 acre uh, community park um, named after um, Mr. Biddle. So upon com completion, the future 30 acre Don Biddle community park will feature a wide variety of amenities, including both tennis and basketball courts, a playground, swing sets and a picnic and barbecue area, a community garden, our veterans art, and much and much more. And I'm sure you're probably seeing that as you drive along Dublin Boulevard, um, you can see some of the play structures already being put in place. Balanced Sports Park phase three represents the final phase of the park's development. This future park will include cricket fields, four sand volleyball courts, two little league fields and a multi-sports batting cage. We hope, to ho we hope to host grand opening ceremonies for both of these parks in the fall. We also hope to break ground soon on the new community park near Wallace Branch Development. We offered many opportunities for our residents to provide feedback on the designs for these future parks. And we went 
we cannot wait to see them come to life. In January, we did see the opening of a new one acre park, Butterfly Knoll, in the Tossahara Hills development. As you know, Dublin pays a great amount of attention to its roadways, always named at the near or top of the list for the best roads in the Bay Area. The city's annual slurry seal project rehabilitated, rehabilitated approximately 80 street segments throughout our Dublin in the year 2021. The next big project is the rehabilitation of Dublin Boulevard from Hacienda Drive to Scarlet Drive, anticipated to begin in late July. Also in our planning department, in our planning process are two projects to widen Tassajara Road, which is a major gateway to and from Contra Costa County. There are two more big projects that we are looking forward to coming out to fruition. The first is the Dublin Boulevard extension into Livermore, which I have mentioned earlier. The second is the Iron Horse Trail Bridge construction work, which is expected to begin this spring with completion in late 2023. The bridge will free span over Dublin Boulevard, providing a safer and quicker crossing for pedestrians and bicyclists traveling along the Iron Horse Trail. Environmental Services staff has been working to meet the goals um, that we set in, in our Climate Action Plan. In our Climate Action Plan, um, we hope to achieve by 2030 and beyond. In January of this year, the default electricity option for all Dublin residents properties was transitioned to East Bay Community Energy's Renewable 100 service. Businesses will also soon move to our Renewable 100. And last summer, the city council also approved a contract with Will Dan to deliver a citywide project that will result in $28 million in utility savings over the next 25 years. Wildan has already begun making energy efficiency and infrastructure improvements and will complete the project in about 24 months. In our Parks and Community Service Division, and after two years of hiatus, we were excited to celebrate the return of our beloved St. Patrick's Day celebration last month. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as we all did. It was wonderful to see all of the smiling faces at the pancake breakfast that's provided by our local 55 firefighters, our festival and our new Shamrock Gala. In late March, renovations were completed at the Dublin Heritage Park and Museums. In addition to new plantings and new pathways through the cemetery, a new pergola with shaded seating and a large gathering space were built next to the old St. Raymond's Church. So if you hadn't had a chance to go out there, please do so. It's such a great little setting and um, with plenty of shade for us to kind of sit down and have a cup of coffee with our neighbors or our friends. So the Dublin's Farmer's Market also returned to Emerald Glen Park for its 12th season earlier this month. So if you have not seen or come out to our Dublin market, please make sure to come out. It's on every Thursday through the end of September. And the popular summer concerts will also return to Farmer's Market for eight weeks beginning June 16th with an 80s cover band. The Dublin Lions Club will also host beer and wine tastings and our vendors will be serving hot food at all of the events. Families can also look forward to seeing the return of our popular picnic flick, picnic flick movie series featuring six popular family-friendly movies this summer and three family campouts. And look for Splatter, our annual multicultural event featuring art and live music and dance ensembles to return in September. The Dublin Senior Center is also thriving again. The center has returned to having an in-person luncheons and seniors are returning for classes, bingo, music jams, and more. The WAVE, 
open year round for swim swimming, our fitness programs, lessons, and swim teams will open the water park again for the 2022 season on Saturday, May 28th for summer fun. And for our public safety division, moving on to our public safety here, as you see on the screen, the city of Dublin contracts with our Alameda County Fire Department for fire protection services. The department is led by our fire chief, William McDonald. In addition to our fire suppression and first responders and paramedic services, Alameda County Fire also regularly puts on disaster preparedness workshops for our staff and also for our residents. The fire department's vegetation management program prevents local fires by patrolling the city to ensure land is free of weeds, dry grasses, and combustibles. In our Dublin Police Services, we provide under a contract with Alameda County Sheriff's Office, and the department is led by our police chair, chief, Garrett Holmes. In addition to patrol and investigations divisions, our Dublin Police also has a strong crime prevent, prevention unit. The school resource officers and the neighborhood watch program are all part of this unit. The division hosts an annual Citizens Academy Youth Academy and which are designated to educate the public about the field of law enforcement. As we all know, COVID-19 had an adverse effect on the mental health of many members of our population. So in September, the city council approved the funding to create a behavioral health unit in our Dublin Police Services. This unit will be staffed by licensed therapists dedicated to working with families, couples, and individuals on getting access to the appropriate services. Alameda County Fire is also prioritizing mental health support. The city of Dublin previously spearheaded a program with the cities of Livermore and Pleasanton to provide support to the Access Bridge Mental Health Urgent Care. The services offer free rapid access to mental health treatment for the Tri-Valley residents. So it just really depends on um, what type of help you need, but a little bit more on that expansion. It does not matter if you have uh, medical insurance, um, if you don't have any medical insurance, if you're on Medi-Cal or if you're on Medicaid, if you do feel that there is, um, you're having a mental health crisis or a friend or family member, please make sure to reach out to our access and they'll help you navigate and triage through the very difficult times. So in conclusion, as you can see, our city of Dublin is honestly stronger than ever. Through the past two years, the resilience and tenacity of our business owners and our residents have been a source of inspiration to me and the council. The city is stronger than ever because of the strength and dedication of our staff. They come to work every day with one goal, making Dublin a better city than it was yesterday. So thank you for your love and service to our city. And so now um, we have the remainder of our time this evening for an open forum for everyone in attendance. This is your opportunity to ask us any questions or to raise any concerns that you may have. And you can also submit your questions to the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. And additionally, if you would like to speak with us directly, please raise your hand and we will unmute you. So tonight to assist, we will have um, John Stefanski here to help with our Zoom um, since he's the technical savvy one out of the group. And then we will also have our assistant city manager, Colleen Trivby. So do we have any questions, John? Yeah, so good evening, Mayor. Um, we had one that was submitted online prior to the meeting, which uh, this is from Nick. And he says, uh, are there any plans for the open lot to become a neighborhood park at 2150 Central Parkway over in Jordan Ranch. So Colleen, do you um, know exactly the location of 
of the I bot. am. I was trying to, uh, first of all, uh, good evening again, everyone. I was trying to start my video, John, but I, I've been prohibited from showing my oh, face. Well, we'll get you. Um, John, can you read that address again for me, please? Uh, it is uh, 2150 Central Parkway. That is a great question. And off the top of my head, I, I, I don't think I have the answer for that, but we can certainly provide that. Do we, John, are we keeping track of who's asking the questions? Yeah, and I have Nick's uh, email address. Perfect. To, to get back okay. So we'll handle that one that way. Okay, great. Thank you. And it looks like we have a question from Eric and the question and answer. Eric's asking, can you say more about the downtown area that is being planned in the Target Plaza? Will those businesses remain? And will there be uh, performing arts, film, et cetera, destinations? So as we process through the navigation of our downtown, um, I know that it's been aware, it's been brought to some of our attentions with regards to some of the, um, I can tell you that Target is staying there. Target will not be moving out of the, our west side uh, Dublin. I know that's been a question that's been asked and kind of zooming around. So with regards to Target, um, it's it's a it's a big huge um, anchor store there. And so for us to lose Target, that would not be wise of, wise of us at all whatsoever. And with regards to um, being uh, more businesses coming in, absolutely. We hope that the businesses that are there will stay there, such as Hobby Lobby. I know that there's a couple of other businesses in that area. And um, I know that Burlington Co. Factory or Burlington Factory wants to move into a different area. And as you know, that the Toys R Us is, will most likely, um, that building will be the first building to go. And that's where our, our little square will be. And then you'll see the rollout and the core of the entire um, vision for the downtown to know exactly what restaurants or businesses, um, commercial buildings or so on will be, in, will be placed there. That is something that we will work along um, with our staff and with businesses wanting to come into our city. And I always like to uh, remind our, our residents that businesses want to and have to want to come into our city of Dublin and our economic development team always works really hard to try to get as many businesses as we can. And, um, you know, sometimes we have some outstanding businesses like our seismetic tech that chose Dublin because not only of its diversity, but of its location. And they knew that Dublin was headed in a in a great way, not only financially, but also with just more businesses coming in. So, um, you know, we will, Eric, have some more uh, feedback with regards to residents being able to give us feedbacks on what they want to see there. And we are really always good about doing community outreach all the time. So that's something definitely that I would encourage you to, to provide um, some input. And I think you're also asking about uh, anything with walkable bike group. Am I correct, John? Yeah, he's uh, Eric's second question is with the uh, rehab of Dublin Boulevard. So the upcoming uh, project, will the bike routes be enhanced? Eric has provided feedback to the bike and ped master plan group, but it wonders uh, what is making it into the plan. So Eric, we're still in the beginning process. Um, this is the downtown has, has been on my prior list since before I even got onto council. I wish we could move the process a little bit faster, uh, but sometimes it takes a while. And I'm not sure if you are aware of um, how many particular owners are involved. And so we've had a really had a lot of uh, conversations when how can we get the uh, CCNRs unraveled? And that's been one of our biggest um, obstacles in the downtown areas because we have so many different owners and not necessarily all the different owners agree on what uh, the end result will be. But we will definitely make sure that we make it um, uh, bicyclist 
um, friendly because there are so many people. And as we've learned through COVID that so many people want to either ride their or be outdoors just in general on our trails, our trails ended up being exceeding the hundred percent level. So people want to be able to be on their bikes, be on their electric bikes, being able to walk around, being able to be outdoors. So that's def definitely something that we are going to prioritize in the downtown area. Mayor, may I weigh in for just a moment? I, I appreciate the question about downtown. <laughs> um, and I wanted to point out that, that with the town square that we're designing, um, we're not talking about just a, a one acre of green space. It's a programmed square that will have um, a, a little bit of everything for everybody, seating for outdoor dining. And hopefully that will um, help with the businesses that are still there that we hope to keep. The restaurants that are in that plaza now that are very popular, Yaffa Hummus has gotten a lot of good press for being one of the great um, newer restaurants um, and is frequently on the best of the Bay lists. Um, of course, we have some of our other fast casual restaurants there. We still have um, a fine dining restaurant that we're hoping to get another um, tenant into in that area as well. Um, but also um, art spaces with amphitheater, perhaps, or um, a fountain um, gallery space, maybe, I don't know. Those are all ideas, but it's not going to be just an open space. It will be a programmable space that can host um, outdoor events, farmer's market type events, perhaps movies in the park type events, all of those kinds of things. So we are looking for feedback. It will be, you know, it'll be a park that has public art in it, those kinds of things. And then um, the question about bikes and Dublin Boulevard, um, the Dublin Boulevard extension that we talked about has been planned with bike paths um, all the way to Livermore. Mm -hmm. It is and as a complete street, complete street with um, wide walking paths as well as protected bike lanes. Um, so that um, I believe are those designs on our website, Colleen and John. I know um, we've seen some some designs. Um, that one even included a video of what it would look like to drive down that boulevard that shows what the bike lanes look like. Um, and if that's not on our website, maybe we can get that um, conceptual design up so people can see what biking down the new Dublin Boulevard extension might look like. It's really pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And just to add with regards to the downtown, ours will be um, a unique downtown because it will not just be one main street. It's going to be the range of Dublin Boulevard, San Ramon Valley Boulevard, Amador Valley Boulevard, and Village Parkway. And so that's why, um, you know, to make sure that that entire downtown area is looked upon. And you'll be seeing probably some, some changes as the years go by as well, Eric. And so honestly, we're also help. We're always helping to, to make it the best downtown with different, um, different types of, you know, like we said, cultural arts, a walkable pedestrian, great retail, great shops and commercial. And then you will definitely see some, some housing on the top. So I want to be very transparent about that. All right, our next question is from Tom Evans. He says, uh, during the SCS workshops, the presenters spoke of lots of open space on the east and west ends of Dublin. Why are there planning signs on the properties east of the Dublin city limits? So. Um, I'm not sure which signs he is speaking of. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure about that as well. Um, I think we go to our next question, which is from Vanessa Thomas. She says, thanks for making this forum available to the community. I'm interested to know what the current completion date for the Cultural Arts Center is. So I know that we will be um, hopefully putting a shovel in the ground um, next year. And once we get started, it'll generally take about a year, Vanessa, with regards to once, um, we we like to make sure that we start a start a project and finish it in an appropriate manner. Um, obviously, there's weather that you know we have to consider that uh, will will take play, um, and also, but we're pretty good in target about our projects. I know that Dublin has done very well with once we put a shovel on that ground, it takes us about a year. So it just really depends um, on the weather and if there's any little hiccups here and there, but I, I'm, I'm gonna put my money on about a year. Great, I think our next question here is from Tom Evans. Uh, and I see Tom, you also have your hand raised. So 
what we can do is we'll answer this question and then we'll unmute you for I think your follow up on that previous one. Uh, but Tom asks, what is the income range for moderate income and what is the maximum income for help with affordable housing? So as you know, there's different ranges and um, we work really closely with our, not only our staff, um, we will also be working with Alameda County staff with regards to um, the ranges of the, um, it depends on how many dependents you have, if you have no dependents, if what your income is. So it's generally a different type of um, ranges on depending on how many dependents you have. And Colleen, if you wanna add more on that, that would be useful and helpful. I would love to, Mayor. I don't have those memorized, but that's an easy thing. Uh, to, is that Tom Evans that asked that yeah. question, John? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I can easily get that to him. I was trying to look it up while, we, while you were speaking, Mayor, but uh, I don't, just don't have that off the top of my head. Okay. So it, if I could just jump in just a tiny bit so that maybe not just for Tom, but other people that might be watching, it's, it's percentage of area median income, which changes every year. And um, for each category of percentage of area medium, so moderate, moderate income is 80 to 120% of area median income. Within that category, it depends on for a single person household, a two person household, a three person household, and up to, I believe, eight people in your household, there's, there's a, a, an income limit for each one of those things. So there's, there's that, that range of people for up to 120% of area median income. There is um, for the, um, the next category is I think up to um, between 60 and 80% of area median income. And then there's in the 30 to 60% range. And I might have those ranges just slightly off, but so it, we can't give you a specific number because there are so many different numbers that, that weigh into it. There's a whole table of those numbers and we can, we can give you a link to where that table is, but to spout off each one of those numbers um, would not be very helpful. It depends on the, the family circumstance. And, and I think Vice Mayor, if I could just add, I think um, at least in 2021, the moderate income level, which has those eight categories, right? Depending upon number in the household, is ranges something like 100,000 to almost 200,000. It's somewhere along uh, that range. Yeah. And it, like we said, it really depends if you have dependents. And um, that's something that is always considered. Um, wanting to make sure that people are aware of that and they do change. As we know, it's very expensive to live in the Tri-Valley. It's very expensive to live in California, it seems like. Um, not necessarily just in the Tri-Valley, but there's so many other areas that being able to afford a house is, is becoming close to impossible. So that's something is having two children. Um, uh, and I know that Vice Mayor also has children as well. It's one of those things that we worry about every day. In fact, that is our child going to be able to afford a house? And it's not even necessarily a single family house that they want. They may just be, be able to live in an apartment or to live in a studio. And so it's, it's becoming very expensive. And if you, once you look at that um, actual graph, Tom, you will see that you can have a single mom trying to raise one or two children and she'd have to make X amount of dollars or it's just, you'll start under, I, I think more people will start understanding it once they, they familiarize themselves with that graph that even in the Tri-Valley, it's very difficult as a single mom or a single dad to live um, in this area with the child. All right, and then um, Tom, I see you have your hand raised, so we'll allow you to talk. I think this is probably follow up from the previous question. Hi, this is Janine Gillenbert, and I'm sharing the screen with Tom Evans, and I wanna thank, uh, everyone for this opportunity to, to interface with uh, the city council members. And let me give some clarification on the um, question about the planning signs. I saw from the freeway, uh, there used to be a sign by Croke Road on the property just to the east of Croke Road that looked like a Dublin, city of Dublin planning um, application sign. There's also one currently to uh, right by the landscaping business on the north side of 580 uh, that's kind of at the end of the road 
um, near the uh, 580 Casino, if you're familiar with that area, if you get off the freeway at Airway to go to Costco, if you were mm -hmm. to turn west and go down that road, there's a, a big landscaping business has some signs. And on that, right near that is another planning application sign that looks like city of Dublin. The only sign that I can assume that is, is the Dublin Boulevard extension. Okay, it's, thank you very much. You're welcome. All and right. Then Eric had one more question. Yes. Um, Eric says, is there, um, well, I guess this is more of a, a comment. Um, Eric says that anything you can do to subdue Dublin Boulevard from continuing to be an I-580 alternative would be greatly appreciated. Uh, and then uh, two more comments here. Uh, Tom Evans says, thanks for having this Zoom event. And Eric also says, thanks for this meeting. And those are the only other uh, items we have in the Q&A. Um, well, I, I would like to say um, thank you to Eric and Tom and Janine for um, showing up this evening to our first live meeting. Eric, to, to answer your question or the comment with regards to making Dublin Boulevard, you know, that is our main street. It is a public street. We cannot stop people from exiting the freeway and coming on there. As you also know that Dublin is in between crossroads of 680 and 580. And so not only is Dublin Boulevard used is kind of, you know, uh, a way off of 580, but also uh, Dory and Tassajara. You know, folks coming from San Ramon or Pleasanton, either to or from work in the morning, that is, those are highly used um, streets. And so again, our, our lovely city is, is in between uh, 580 and 680, but I do have to say that it is um, a great city to live, work, and play in. I think the best way we get people to stop using Dublin Boulevard as a cut through is to um, advocate for solving the traffic problems on 580, which I know um, Mayor Hernandez does a lot of with her work on um, the Valley Link and her work on ACTC. We, and I, I do as well on with um, being on the Tri-Valley Transportation Commission, we work on um, helping to fund transportation projects. I know the 580, 680 interchange is one that we talk about a lot in both of those committees. Um, so making sure that we, we advocate for Valley Link, getting the funding for Valley Link, because that will help get traffic off 580. And if 580 is not backed up, then people won't feel like they wanna divert from Dublin Boulevard because um, even when 580 is slow, going through the lights on Dublin Boulevard. Sometimes it takes a little longer than it would take on 580. So um, what one, one thing that we can do and that we do do um, is advocate for transportation solutions, um, getting people on the wheels bus, which we both, we both on that board as well, um, making sure that the buses are efficient, that they're run well, that people know about them, that the routes are good so that we get more people out of single driver single passenger cars um, and on to um, carpooling or tra public transit. And that helps to get people, and of course, promoting bicycles as Eric well knows, um, get people off of 580 and then they won't feel like they want to divert from Dublin Boulevard. So I'm um, not looking at it as a Dublin Boulevard solution, but looking at it as a regional solution is um, the way to go there in my opinion. Yes, and that's something that we've sat on these committees for a while and as you know, um, Valley Link, if you haven't done any of the research on it yet, please go out and, and Google Valley Link. Um, it's transportation from the Dublin Pleasanton BART to the San Joaquin Valley area. It is, it is a $1.8 billion project that we are fighting every day at the state, at the federal level for funding to be able to help with some of that alleviation on 580. Because if you think about how it is congested right now, it's going to be more congested by 2040. And the only way we're going to be able to alleviate, we're never gonna get rid of it. I will be completely honest with you. We're not gonna get rid of all the traffic that's on 580 or 680 or so on, but it will help with um, our essential workers coming into the Tri-Valley from San Joaquin Valley um, to be able to not have an hour and a half 
uh, drive just to get to a place of work or, you know, them going even further for a job. And so, because the houses are more affordable there and people tend to find jobs that pay better in this area. And so they're willing to do the drive to be able to provide for their families. But again, like vice mayor said, is to be able to take public transportation and transit is, is key. Um, I think people are still a little hesitant because of COVID with regards to, you know, getting on that bar or getting on the buses, but we have been seeing our numbers increase uh, slowly, but I do always encourage people to, to take it as much as they can, but make sure you go and read up on Valley Link. It's a great project and we hope we can accomplish that. I really hope I keep pushing our staff to say, Hey, let's put a shovel in that ground by 2024, but they keep saying 2025. So we'll see. We will see. All right. And it looks like uh, Tom Evans or Janine, they have their hand up again. So I think we still have some time here. Uh, we can have them unmute and ask another question. Hang on. Hi, thank you very much. This is Janine Gillenburton again. And I wanted to first say um, how grateful I am that the city is moving forward with a new EIR for the SCS project. I think that's, that's, a, uh, that's a wonderful thing. And I would like to very strongly request that the city reconsider using the um, old EIR from, uh, from the 90s and from the early 2000s to uh, investigate the conditions for the East Ranch project. Um, just if you look at the, uh, at the terrain, the wildfire hazards, uh, there is, there's, I think there's a lot of issues that need to be addressed um, and that a current and new EIR is the, is the what we need to have. So just to clarify, I want for the viewers that are watching or will be watching this later at a later time, um, 2005 is when it was accomplished. And I know there's been some dates here and there being thrown around. And just to clarify um, that it was done in 2005, and then Colleen, did you want to go ahead and add um, a little bit more on that? You're on mute. I'm having a little bit of audio issues. Um, uh, well, I think you said it, uh, Mayor. I mean, I think we've been pretty clear about, um, about when that initial study was done. Um, and I think we've discussed it at a public meeting and um, you know, it's forums like this and at public meetings where we can hear public input and that's what the city council listens to and takes into account when they make decisions. So I definitely think that the council and certainly staff have heard, have heard that comment um, and, and take that seriously and take it into account in that project. That's what I would say on that. And then if you, if viewers that are watching this evening, um, can go back and look at all the different um, arenas that were actually studied. Um, so that's really informative for viewers to go back and look, and then they can go ahead and see the results that were, um, were studied. All right, and it looks like we have one more public comment here from Eric just saying thanks for the reference to Valley Link. Um, the one thing I would like to share with the viewers is that uh, the city wants to hear from you for these meetings. And so if you have ideas or comments for upcoming meeting topics to visit our website and search for the live with the city council uh, meeting uh, webpage, and there'll be a form that you can complete and we'll use that information to help uh, plan future meetings. Yes, and like John said, it's always great to get ideas from our residents with regards to which topics we will talk about next. Um, again, today was just our first one. It was a little bit of an overview of what, uh, what I shared at our State of the City a few weeks ago, but to also just to let our residents know that not only are you living in such a great city, you're living in a great diverse city that is financially in a very strong position. Um, I earlier had uh, a lunch with the mayors all in the Tri-Valley and um, I always let them ask me, I don't wanna sit at the table and start bragging about Dublin right away, but uh, I know that compared to the other cities, um, not only do we have great staff, we have a great uh, police and fire department and we also have our great residents here that make Dublin what it is and has made Dublin um, what it will be in the future. And so having our 24 beautiful parks 
Our schools are great. Our, um, you know, for us always trying to fight to have great roads, to be able to bring in innovation into our cities. Um, I know that we have, even as something as small as texting our residents once they sign up, and that's something I do want to share. If you are not aware of our texting um, capabilities that we have in our city, please come on our website. You can go ahead and sign up to be able to get um, notifications of happenings that are, are going on in Dublin. And also, um, when you see projects coming forward, we post everything. We're a very transparent city. Our residents may not always like the decisions that our council makes, but honestly, we are truly trying um, to make the best decisions for not only for our entire community, but also for the younger generation that um, I know that Vice Mayor and I have raised our, our kids here in a community for so many years. This is their home. So when we take and make these um, decisions, we don't take them lightly at all whatsoever. We probably leave, um, lose a couple hours of sleep at night, but um, we definitely um, care about our community 110%. And so I wanna thank all of you for joining us this evening. I will let Vice Mayor say a few words. I wanna echo what you said about um, we have great staff. We are lucky that we get good advice. We get well-researched staff reports. Um, but we also have engaged residents, which I think is great for us because we, we get lots of good feedback. We know what residents want us to do. Um, we hear the same themes over and over and over again. They want affordable housing. They want a downtown. They want retail that is pedestrian friendly. They want bike and pedestrian paths. They want um, well-programmed, well-thought-out parks that have something for everyone. They want diversity, equity, and inclusion in our rec guide. Um, and I think that we really listen to the kinds of things that they're asking for. And I think we are lucky that we have a council of five that works well together, that we don't always agree. And I think that's actually good because when you get into an echo chamber, that's not a good thing either. Um, but we listen and respect each other and um, we get great input from our residents. And so um, we are lucky to be able to serve the city of Dublin. And I thank you for participating um, and asking us questions in our inaugural Dublin Live um, sessions. And hopefully um, we'll see more folks come out and I appreciate getting the opportunity to participate in this first one. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then John, if you could just give our announcement when our next um, live meeting will be. Our next uh, meeting will be in August, the first Monday in August. So we hope to see everyone there. Thank you so much and thank you for joining us this evening. We'll see you tomorrow.